All right. Cool. Have you ever done this before? Have you ever streamed before, Lucas? No, never. It's my first time. Oh, uh, cool. This is nice. What got you, uh, like, are you excited about this? Is this weird? Yes, yes. Uh, well, of course, it's weird. No, the first time uh, speaking in front of people that they, they are not actually in front of you. So it's kind of, it's both exciting and I'm a bit nervous, but that's my personality. So yeah, I dig it. This is, um, all right, cool. So how let's, I, th I think most of the people in the channel know who I am and nobody has any idea who you are. So um, how'd you get started? How'd you start making puzzles? Why do you make puzzle games, Lucas? Okay, so um, I guess I was interested in video games in general during, during my life, but I didn't have a lot of consoles. I do remember spending uh, my first money with my brother buying the PS1, and that kind of started everything. But it was really expensive. I couldn't afford uh, almost any game, so I tend more to follow the press to just... I was intrigued where the video games were going, but at the point I never thought I could be a, a game de developer. It wasn't even on my mind that possibility. So um, I was just there lurking the, the video game world until like six years ago, more or less. Uh, after playing The Witness, it was actually, uh, there's this uh, secret content at, at some point that you have a lot of lectures, and one of them is, it ends with a sentence uh, like, um, creating awe in video games. And that um, clicked me, and I, and I ju just saw the opportunity of, okay, it is possible actually to make games. It's not something that, that I, I cannot be a flower, I can grow flowers, but I can be a game developer, I can make my own games. So uh, it started there, uh, that uh, fits with uh, the idea that I make puzzle games because the first game that introduced me to this world was a puzzle game. And also makes sense that I like puzzle games because I studied maths at college. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'm a mathematician also, although I don't use maths uh, every day after finishing. It's, it is difficult to find a mathematician job. You just fit in any company for doing a lot of different jobs. But, but yes, that, that feeling of understanding that uh, that discovery of, of the truths that are already there is something really appealing to me. I, I really enjoyed. And at first, uh, when I was learning um, how, to, how to start, I wasn't trying to make uh, puzzle games at first. I just throw rules to the, to the engine and, and saw how they interact with each other. But I think that led me to puzzle games pretty quickly. But I didn't knew Sokoban as, as a genre uh, mm -hmm. until I, I joined the, the Discord. Actually, so I, you, uh, yeah. you said you didn't, uh, when you started, you didn't know you were going to make puzzle games. You were just throwing stuff into the engine. So what did you start, what did you start making? Like what was the first couple of games you made and what were you using? In more uh, uh, shooter-like, actually, more yeah, top-down, but uh, something with bullet, but bullets and different enemies and how they interact with each other. Maybe some kind of roguelike or something like that. This kind of alive environments that where, where everything interacts with each other. Everything has more than one purpose. That uh, is something that. I find beautiful in systems that actually everything interacts with each other is not this is specific for all this. yeah the combinatorics so, the unexpected things that happen when you have a lot of different uh, things that can combine of course yeah 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 exactly so well actually I started I I did a new programming my first goal was to make um, a, a labyrinth generator actually so I was creating these games in labyrinth labyrinths that I was creating procedurally. Uh, because I didn't know how to create uh, think, uh, things uh, manually, actually. I, I wasn't sure how, when would I want to make a corridor and when, when would I want to make a big room. So I tend to, to do things procedurally and then add objects that interact with the space and with each other. That's um, interesting. And then you move from that to puzzles. Somebody in the chat yeah. asked, and I'm, I'm curious too, what were the tools that you were using? Or the resources when you were starting out, like you, you've mentioned several times, you just started in the engine, you you started out making a thing procedurally, and you don't, you're not a programmer, so you didn't start out like yeah. programming it. So how did you get, how did you so, get going? Uh, 
Uh, at first, I learned C++ a bit, so my first game was in console. It was just uh, displaying with characters uh, a labyrinth. And then I I had a friend that w was actually more into game development, and he he's uh, like a pro of, of programming, and he wasn't scared about any engine. So he was starting with Unreal Engine, actually, and... It scared me a lot at that point because I, I was just learning the basics and you have this um, waterfall of possibilities. Uh, you're blowing my mind right now because you're like, I was learning the basics by making a game in C++ and to me that's impossible. <laughs> like, I would much rather start with an engine. Like, Unreal feels, it, to me, maybe because come, I come from art and so like, I'm used to Maya and a viewport and, and working in that way. But, so you're saying you just started making an ASCII maze in C++, and that's how you... Yeah. Jesus. Weird. Yeah, that's interesting. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. It was actually in in college, I did have one class of programming, so mm -hmm. I did know the console. I knew that there was something there Christ. which I, I could do the things, yeah. Man, I can't install Visual Studio. Like, I've reached <laughs> a point... It's like, I had to the other day. I, was, I installed Visual Studio and I tried to link it to my game and I just hit a wall where I'm like, this isn't worth it. Like... Yeah, no, I, I completely understand. Actually, I, I had that, that point that after a few months, I uh, I thought that this was going really slow. If I wanted to be a game developer and I'm only achieving to do some nasty things, uh, it, it was, I wasn't going to get far uh, at that rate. Yeah. So I started to to, to look for, for engines. Uh -huh. And this first contact with, with uh, Unreal Engine was scary. Uh, Unity was the same. And then I found Game Maker, and Game Maker was incredibly fast. It mm -hmm. was uh, after five minutes, you had already a character moving and interacting with other things with five minutes. So I just stood with that because I was working at the time. I I, I had a, a complete other life, so mm -hmm. I I had little free time to to spend to learn this. Yeah, this whole time, cause there's several things to ask here. Like, what job did you have with a math degree? And were you working, I think you were working part-time this entire time, or were you full-time initially? Uh, uh, initially, I was full-time, actually. A full-time, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, you were you were full-time at a job, and you started make you were working in C++ for how long? Like, a couple of months, maybe, before you... Yeah, yeah, a couple of months, yeah. Okay. Yeah, after finishing college, I had this, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, a leap year, because I didn't want... I, I was really into art, I was an actor, I, I did, did a lot of things and I expected that the possibility of working of any of that uh, of that uh, things was not possible so I had to think what thing w um, would I focus on uh, uh, until that point, uh, from that point mm -hmm. and what job should I should I do in the meantime. <coughs> yes. So uh, the, also the video games started uh, being a variable in, at that point and before getting my job, I did a trip to Italy with my camera, my my computer, everything, just to, okay, I, I like writing, I like making photos, I like mm, a lot of things. And it was there where I decided, okay, I'm going to focus on video games because I like this multidisciplinary disciplinary, disciplinary thing that you work with musicians, you work with narrative, you have everything there. So that feels really fresh and, and really, I don't know, I think it's it grows on me uh, hearing about other people's experiences that are really far, but uh, at the same time we can connect in the same, in the same product. That uh, is really nice to me. And I finally got a job in in transport, it was a transport consultant. So basically, basically, I developed a software for um, people who planify trains. Actually, I, I was yeah. working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's it's awesome. Yeah, I actually yeah. think it's a really cool job because like that's a job that could be a game, like optimizing how trains get around and things like that. That's funny, man. And yeah. that's and I always. It's weird to me when I was at Irrational, the number of people that came or have some kind of background in theater. I It's one of those things that's not really mentioned, but especially for like narrative games, uh, a lot of people compare video games to film, but in reality, it's more like it, there, there's something to it that's more like theater where you can't exactly control a camera or tell a, a person where to look. You just kind of have to be doing things and experimenting in different ways. Um, mm. But yeah, the anyway. 
I, I think that's cool. I think it's cool. I know you're a musician. I know you're like a Renaissance man. You're into, th- you're an actor. Uh, you decided you at some point dabbled it. W- was all of this stuff that you're saying now before you started dabbling in C++? Like that, uh, when it was the after, it was after, it, it was after. Yes. I, I, I already knew Game Maker at that point where mm-hmm. I, I saw these, uh, velocity of learning much faster, this uh, difficulty curve of learning will uh, suddenly disappear completely and I th- I felt like I could make a game finally, a, a real game with graphics and, and everything because in C++ that would have taken me forever because I'm not really tech, I, I don't manage well with computer, uh, our conversations are always awkward so uh, I needed something that was fast and and yeah and that was maybe the reason uh, that I could uh, choose that that path that path I'm now on. Nice. So yeah. you what you decided you made this decision in Italy. You decided I will focus on on being a game developer. Yes. Hmm. And yeah. that that was what six years ago then. Do you think or? Yeah yeah I think um, maybe five years ago. Five yeah. years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. At this point and at this point. Um, you started. What was your first game in Game Maker? Uh, my first game in Game Maker it was called Labyrinth because it was and it's uh, it's a secret project. It's not anywhere. It was my learning uh, project, and at the end it was horrible. It was really crazy because no one would would never understand the rules. There uh, there were a lot of little things that I added, and after a lot of time uh, watching your own game, of course you are familiar with it. But it, it was crazy. So uh, after that, I started make, making other prototypes, trying to to uh, diversify the the knowledge I had. And I started join, uh, joining some game jams with some friends mm-hmm. that started really badly, but were really, really funny. I, I had a great time in, in the first game jams where everything was a problem. Everything, uh, deciding the theme, decide, deciding anything, just implementing it, not, not having a, an artist. It was really, really fun. Actually. Man, I've never done a game jam. Like I, I've, it's just it's part of the culture that's that it like those became popular long after I was already in the industry, and then it was just kind of yeah. I, I like I, I can think of we did we did games in college. Like I would get together groups and we would try to make a game together, but it was always such a mess. It was a shit show because like we'd get together a couple of artists. They largely all used their own software. It largely didn't work together. Collaborating with others, I think, was honestly just the most difficult thing early on, um, mm. because you don't know each other, you don't necessarily respect each other. Everybody's got their own goals out of this. Like uh, the one person just really wanted to make a bit of three D art for their portfolio and didn't care about the game, and it was mostly about that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess a game jam at least has the focus of you're all going to make a game together but how do you do you, is there how do you agree on anything like do you set the teams up ahead of time or mm, that was actually our problem at first communication like uh, communication is the most difficult task in anything and mm, uh, what we did was uh, fail a couple of times. It was the plan it wasn't the plan but it was the outcome uh, yeah just brute force through that yeah yeah, it makes sense, and uh, you understand that not everyone can make every decision, and that there should be c- some kind of roles. Everyone can, of course, uh, make their, their their opinion, share their opinion, to try to shift the game in a certain direction. But in the end, everyone should have uh, uh, the ownership of what they are doing. Mm-hmm. So, I think that was our first problem to encounter in making these collaborative games, and I, I actually. Um, in the end, these uh, these friends don't do games anymore, and I used to make games on um, by my own on on game jams. Game jams is actually uh. a lot of work, but uh, you get rid of all the communication. You have uh, everything in your brain. It's a bit easier, but much more exhausting. Yeah, because the game only moves forward if you move forward and so forth. I think like there's a lot of different reasons to do, to do a game jam. I think Alan brought up one point like it's a great time to it's like a way to experiment with um, working with somebody before you actually get invested in a real project, like to find people to work with. And I feel like if you do a game jam alone, you're missing out on that part, which might be probably pretty valuable. 
But I did love yeah. your, um, which was it? I played your latest game jam game. It was a loop is a loop. And that was quite good. I think, I, how many, I've played a, a lot of your games. I don't know how many of them are from jams. Like there was that one that was based on Snake that I really liked quite a bit. Yeah, that was from Aludum there. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. most of my games are from jams, but not all of them. There are some projects that took me um, some months that were actually just um, an attempt to create a, a, a step a step forward, try to do something um, increasingly complex each time that, um, okay, I actually saw the, the evolution between projects. Okay, uh, I handled this this way. I saw the problem it had. Now I have I have to do it this way. That this makes much more sense. It's much more easier for me if to, I need to make change, changes, etc. So yeah, yeah. Well, each game can become more sophisticated because you can build on the code base and and what you know and and your processes that you've established in the previous game. If you're doing it right, that's the way it, it should be. Um, yeah. up until you like wildly change genres, which you actually have done. Like, I will say a lot of your game jam game, you, one of them was a visual novel, if yeah, I recall. Last one, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't enjoy visual novels, but I had this idea and I actually, these last days, uh, I've been focusing hard on puzzle games and I wanted to do something different just to, mm. mainly I, I was concerned if I could, um, Express something uh, beyond the the doubt and the and the wonder of puzzle games. If I could mm -hmm. have other type of messages. So when did you when did you decide to focus on puzzle games? Because I remember you said your first game was like a like a top down shooter sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Was it the witness that inspired you to to focus on puzzle games or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, of course. I actually also uh, was really fan of Myst uh, during my my young age, but that's that's uh, mm, that's not the kind of puzzle game I tend to do. I think it's much more content-driven, so you need a lot, a lot of work mm -hmm. instead of these systems that you have some rules and then you can create a handful of, of levels that are really easy in terms of programming. It's the same base for a lot of content. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, uh, I decided to focus, I, I, I don't think it was on purpose. I, I just saw it was naturally, I, I was kind of good at it. I felt comfortable with it, basically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the ideas I tend to have go more in that direction than in any other. But I do want to to do other stuff, of course. I don't think I will uh, uh, ever forget the puzzle games. I will continue to make puzzle games all my life. But I do want to make a lot of different things. I think that's if I chose uh, doing video games because it's very multicultural. I don't. I can't focus on a single thing. Yeah. No. I know. I'm the same way. Like I enjoy the variety. Like I enjoy mm -hmm. being able to do different things. I think you can you can stick in a genre and still kind of experience variety. Like this game is extraordinarily different from Kine, for instance, which is extraordinarily different from anything else you made or I've made. Sorry, uh, but yeah, that, that I I totally get it. Do you know what you want to mm -hmm. do next? Or I guess we're skipping around way too much here, but no. Yeah, I I I can I have this kind of ob obsessive behavior that if I'm working in, with an idea, other ideas are superfluous. So I won't know until I have the next idea in front of me. Man, that's a, a skill I wish I had. <laughs> that's a rare skill. The I can't focus on any other idea until I'm done with the one I'm on. That's a beautiful, beautiful problem there, Lucas. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, uh, but but uh, it's it's something good that, that at first can be bad actually because after making uh, this uh, initial project when I, when I started I started making a, a puzzle game and I spent a year on it uh, and the everything was bad about it uh, the code especially was really spaghetti uh, everything broke uh, at, uh, at each point and after one year I had the strength to quit uh, and start over something smaller. I, I think finishing th things uh, gets much, much more value in the long term than uh, keeping in a first project that you don't re when you don't really have the knowledge to do it. So um, at that point, this obsession I think it was it was detri detrimental for me because mm -hmm. I 
even if I learn a lot during that year, I learn at a, a much slower pace, I think. Yeah, if you're not excited about what you're working on, if you don't believe in it, um, or if it's just not coming together. And it's hard to know because sometimes you have to push through that. Like sometimes there's times in the middle of a project where it's just something's not coming together or you're not sure why you're doing it. And you can kind of lose faith in and you, you kind of the thing, the jokes that were funny aren't funny anymore because you've heard them a million times. The puzzles aren't interesting to you because you've beaten them a million times. And it's mm. uh, it's hard to know if you're really onto something and you need to push through like a dark period or if it's just not going to come together. And I think I don't know when when I'm in that I usually just get somebody to play it or look at try to get fresh eyes or go on a break and come back and see if I'm still interested in it. Mm. Um, but. Yeah, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. You, you just uh, lose the reference point when you are alone in your own project. You need someone that says, "Okay, you are going in the right direction or not," mm -hmm. uh, because you are. It's it's beca it becomes uh, really personal for you. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, and solo dev just makes it so much harder too. Jesus. So you had a game that you were, um, <clears throat> you had a game that you were making for a year at some point there. And then yeah. you switched over and you started working on a different project that was yeah. much better. What was the project that was much better? Um, no, the first one wasn't better. I, I, I oh. actually just, I, I understood that I needed to finish something. So I started with this idea of, okay, one week projects. But uh, the first one was the first one was what one week, the next one two weeks, and then one month, two months, three months. But it makes sense at that point. Uh, okay, I'm taking longer because I'm adding more content. I'm learning more stuff around it. So yes, the first the first the first two weren't very good, but uh, I managed to make something better at, at the time. Yeah. It, the, uh, uh, the first game I made after that that was uh, kind of disappointing, but it only take, it took me one week, so it doesn't make. Uh, uh, any, uh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't painful. Like if you yeah, ship, yeah, if you, you just need to ship something. Yeah. Yeah. I understand the feeling. Okay, mm -hmm. so some people are asking um, what aspects of LabRat we are each responsible for and what tools we use to create it. I guess we should talk about how we um, <clears throat> started LabRat because we started this. Let me think. I looked it up the other. I looked it up before this. It was okay. March. It was like the second week of March, uh, less than a year ago, last year in 2020. You made that first puzzle script game, mm -hmm. um, which we should also at some point. Like, when did you switch over to puzzle script? By the way, uh, mm, I think it was last last year. No, uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. I think it was at the point I, I knew from that. Uh, before that, uh, actually from the Discord, the Thinky Puzzle Discord, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it is really a good tool for prototyping things. I actually made a full game there, uh, apart from other really small projects, mm -hmm. but but yes, it was actually the, another another point for fast prototyping. For fast prototyping. Yeah. That, uh, I think it's uh, ideal in in the twenty first century century to be able to do something really fast and then visualize it if it makes sense or not. Yeah, you need to prove the fun first because that's going to be the hardest thing, and you don't want to get bogged down in any kind of tech stuff until you've proved the fun, and then the tech stuff and the art and everything else will layer on top of it. I generally find the what is so much harder than the how. And the how you can. The how is the fun part almost, um, hmm. but the uh, okay. So yeah, so you switched over. You were doing some stuff in Puzzle Script. We were hanging out in Discord one day. So Lucas and I know each other just because um, we are two people that have made Silk Bond games before. Uh, I launched a game called Kine. Lucas was working on a game called um, uh, Inner Tau. Yeah. Which do you, do you want to talk about Inner Tau at all or? Well, yeah, it's a game that I finished like a year ago, but I didn't release it because taxes and all that problems. So it's some it's something that it's grew apart from me. I, I don't feel it like mine anymore. I will release it very soon, actually. But it's just something that uh, some leverage that I, I have to to get. Yeah, it's it's like the, my past that is following me, and I live in the present. I just want to release it now that I'm actually a full time developer, and uh, it makes sense to make uh, to pay all those taxes because there's yeah because uh, taxes are complicated. I don't like taxes. There are like a puzzle game with really bad puzzles. <laughs> they are unpleasant. 
and you can only lose. Like you're just yeah. mitigating how much you lose. It's not a fun game at all. No. Understood. So you were working on Inner Tau, which I thought was, um, a, and we were uh, sharing builds back and forth and stuff because we, uh, there's like a hand, there's like a handful of us that are making bigger, often 3D Sokoban style puzzle games. And we kind of share, we all sort of share builds between us because it's a very small club of people in the entire world that are doing this. Um, I had finished Kine. I was about, let's see, at that point I had shipped Kine in October. Um, I had been winding down on that and started up on a tactics game and it had just hit a wall where it wasn't coming together. Um, the person I was collaborating with kind of flaked off. I was really frustrated and COVID had started. And I think I said in, uh, in Discord, I was like, I, I had gotten back from the grocery store and I said, this should be a puzzle game, that we should make a puzzle game about COVID, about socially distancing in the grocery store. I just need to, it was like what you said. It's like, I just need to make something extremely fast because I'm stuck on this game. I think I might need to abandon this tactics game. It's not coming together and I need a, a palate cleanser. And I just said, man, I wish I could make a puzzle game about socially distancing in the grocery store. And Lucas just banged out a puzzle script game in, like in an hour if I recall, or, and I remember you were like thinking, you were typing it out as you were doing it. You're like, here's what it should be. <laughs> there should be a block and it should be, you should move it around. Like you move around the fork in, in, uh, in um, what was it? Steven's sausage. Steven's sausage, yeah. Uh, but it's a cart that you can grab and uh, it'll have four sides to it. And then he just built it. I, I think we could, we could probably post it somewhere. Um, the, yeah. the first version of what eventually became lab rat was a, the idea was there was this cart um, and somebody, you would push people out of the way with a cart. You can't touch them. If you touch them, you die of COVID. And this was like the, this was our stupid little game jam game. Um, and we, Here we are almost one year later after this jam concept. Yeah, it's <laughs> yes, a different game it's now. It's clear that you haven't they, they done game jams. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I've never done a game jam. I thought we were gonna, yeah, well, I mean, I, I sort of start out, I take no risk. I'm like, if this launches in three weeks and it's just a silly little game, I don't care. And I, if I start to like it, I'm like, okay, it would be a bummer to do that. We will launch it in three months. <laughs> I will give it proper art. And then enough thing happens that I won't, I won't care, but I'll be happy because you know, it'll, it'll, I'll have had some fun. And then that just kind of escalate. The game just grows um, until it's a place where I will be sad. Uh, <laughs> If it grows and I, uh, like, until I run out of money or care, like, run out of money or give a shit. That's generally how I, this is terrible, I'm, like, describing my process. I let scope creep if it makes sense repeatedly. Um, but yeah, we did, we definitely did start this out planning to make that, that COVID game. And we definitely, um, real, I think it was at the time when I started this in March, I thought socially distancing at the grocery store was funny. Within three weeks, that was no longer funny. In fact, it was quite dark. Uh, COVID was picking up and people were dying. And I was like, oh, I no longer want to make this game at all. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we and I, I remember, I, I, Lucas, you were still like way into it at the time. And I had this horrible thing where I'm like, oh, man, Lucas is excited about this game. And, and I, there were a couple of mechanics that I really enjoyed, but some way or another, they managed to get to Lab Rat, so we haven't really lose anything, yeah. so I'm well, happy. What were the mechanics that you enjoyed in that game? I think it was actually the the uh, the robots grabbing the the card, well, the customers grabbing the card that it's now uh, inside that they grab the card that you are grabbing instead mm -hmm. of uh, the classical sticky behavior that it sticks to everything. Mm -hmm. So I like that um, small variation, and I did like the. Um, the idea of that is not in the game of having to go inside the supermarket, uh, get all the targets, and then get out again. But mm -hmm. it felt, I don't know, a bit different from the usual uh, target crate. Yeah, I guess I could see that. Yeah, because you had to go in there, get your groceries, and get out with your car. Yeah. Hmm. The um, so what <laughs> the mechanics that we repurposed for the multiplayer was initially a joke where there was a, a toilet paper. And yeah. if you got toilet paper near any of the customers, they would grab it because they wanted it and they would snarl at you because 
that was at, in March. That was funny. Um, <laughs> God, I'm glad we didn't make that game. Yeah, yeah. I remember the model that you made with, with the snot, the, the uh, longest snot on earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was... Uh, and yes, the, the lasers were initially people that were sneezing. We... we um, <laughs> So basically, I told Lucas we couldn't make that game anymore, but I felt really bad about it. And so I was like, oh, let me just come up with a theme that we can repurpose. And um, I think at that point, if I recall, you and I had a, a chat where we were like, what do we like? Why is this game good? What did we like about it mechanically? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like if we were going to make a game that was a Sokoban game together. Uh, what did we like about this that we want to repurpose? What do we think could make it better? And then you went back into puzzle script, if I recall, and you experimented with like, let's keep the let's keep the guys that are sneezing. And I think you experimented with like turning lasers. Uh, yeah. We decided they were lasers. You tried about like, what if you can climb them and turn them? I think what I always loved about this was um, the idea that you could climb over the cart. Was that even in the? No, that, was, that was yeah, that was in the transition, and uh, it is a really cool mechanic. It allows for a, a lot of free movement, so you are not that constrained like uh, in Sokoban, uh, yeah. in Vanilla Sokoban. Yeah. That was that was a big change because I yeah, it just feels so much more freeing. Like Sokoban mm -hmm. is just you push a block against a wall and then you can never touch it again, and you kind of have to. That's sort of something you know instinctively if you play a lot of Sokoban games, but people who are new have to learn that and it's not like a fun thing uh mm -hmm. in general there's just not a lot of um there, there's just so little freedom of movement whereas if you have a verb here like you can climb it you can grab it if something's against the wall you can just grab it and move it away from the wall you can focus on puzzles that are more interesting not because of how you're positioning yourself necessarily but because of um i, I think there's just something more interesting in, in the way that it like what we have here is the charge is like transferring and getting the charge to be the right colors and so forth. And so mm -hmm. moving, I, I thought that was what, what was really interesting about this game was moving away from having the actual movement being the constraining thing. Um, and mm -hmm. I thought that really opened it up. Yeah, that was, so that was big. And that was when, was that like April last year we started on this? Yeah, m more or less, yeah. I would say. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're, you're bummed we never got the, uh, the entering the grocery store grabbing like multiple targets and then exiting yeah yeah i did um, i don't miss it that much i was uh, i did like how it fit the, the theme how it, it was actually the the whole action of going into the groceries buying the different things and then going out that i thought was kind of a a nice loop inside the level it didn't make sense to 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 change it to the to the new theme so it's not something that I miss, but I did enjoy it, how it, it fit the theme at the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so that's... Um, Marcos asked at one point how we work together. Uh, how do we work together, Lucas? Very well. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I guess at first, when I was with Puzzle Script, uh, I was just sending you more refined versions with a couple more levels. But at one point, of course, I need to face my fears and start working with your Unreal Engine, which I, which now I'm working 100% of the time, and I'm super comfortable that it's not this creepy uh, software. It's just a very handy, handy tool that I love, and. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not sure how I would would describe working with you. We just uh, we just share and iterate, and uh, yeah. we may disagree or agree, but we all always kind of follow this conversation in these s small uh, um, um, time windows. Um, I don't know. I think I think it's really easy because we just share and then. Uh, uh, continue the conversation or not, depending on if we have an agreement or not. Yeah, I think the other um, a thing that helps a lot is I've never been really good at like paper design, and I don't think a Sokoban game lends itself well to that either. Like um, times in the past, when I think I've like if I had to write down what I wanted from somebody, like writing a game design doc, I don't even know if I could do it. You know, it's so much easier to just show. Like I think this mechanic is cool. It's easier to just build a quick prototype. Um, cause uh, there's a couple times I think where I just built a quick prototype and I showed you something 
and I, what is refresh my memory because there's a couple things where I, I think I made a prototype and it just didn't pan out, right? Um, mm, like I I don't remember right now. Like yeah, yeah. Basically, one of us has an idea and we just kind of experiment with it. And if it's if Lucas can build it in Puzzle Script, he'll build it in Puzzle Script um, and prove it out. Uh, Sometimes you've asked for things that like there's a we have a Google Doc which is just like ideas for mechanics, mm -hmm. and I think when we first came up with that, that was just sort of brainstorming like how do we add more variety to the game because it was clear how do I put it there's a huge difference between making like a half hour puzzle script game and like a six ten hour game right like you need a um, there's different kinds of there, there's different kinds of discovery. There's figuring. There's that eureka moment when you figure out a puzzle specifically because you've mastered the mechanics. But there's also the delight in learning mechanics for the first time, um, and so there has to be a certain amount of variety in, in any given puzzle game. I think. And so I think it was always important. To, well, any puzzle game that has a certain sort of length, um, and and so I thought it was important to come up with like some different modes. And we were definitely. I remember at one point you made like a Google Doc that uh, had a bunch of different ideas for different modes and things. Hmm. And at the time I was trying to figure out how to tie any of them into any kind of narrative. Um, specifically, like, I'm trying to remember what it, we reached. I reached the conclusion that this was going to be a game that, that was a parody of other games. Um, because that was when I think the the game found its voice and it started to really come together. Hmm. Uh, and that I was... I remember that point. Yeah. I think I was like, oh... Got it. Now I know what we're making. I think I put this. Working with you is really, really fun. <laughs> and Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's because you're always willing to prototype and because the, we didn't need to know exactly what we were making right when we began. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of, we just started making a game and the game made itself clear what it was going to be. You know what I mean? Hmm. Whereas, yeah. um, and you're never like afraid to try something and throw away work, uh, which was definitely something I think I've experiment experienced in in AAA a lot more. People would be very um, uh, well uh, for various reasons. When you're in AAA, say the the director has a vision for the game, uh, and then the if your director is like a writer, they change the script, and now a whole mechanic or a, a whole part of the game is cut even though it's good it just has to be cut because it doesn't fit with the full game um you know if you're an employee that you're like well there we go again changing direction this is terrible because your your entire thing if you're an employee has been you were full time on just that section um and somebody yeah. just cut like three months of your work uh and so in AAA, when when projects get bigger uh, changing direction or not knowing exactly what the direction is in the beginning is a huge problem. But when you're indie, it's, it's really not a huge problem. You can just kind of keep pushing until you figure it out. Um, <laughs> which I think you just naturally do. Yeah, yeah and it, for me, it makes sense to cut things in the end because um, what they say that uh, comparison is not a good idea. I don't know how it's the... Um, the saying in English, but that uh, comparison is complicated. But I think it's actually useful. If I've if I've made five puzzles, I think those five five puzzles five puzzles are good. But then, I, if I have fifteen, then I can compare which of those are worse. And uh, as you as you focus on the bigger picture, you see what things do make sense and, and what don't. And of course, you can make mistakes during that process. And for me, it's completely natural to to just uh, get rid of bad ideas that you had and acknowledge that you that those are bad ideas for the game. Mm. I mean, or an idea can be good, but it cannot fit too, and that can happen a lot. Um, mm. So somebody asked, uh, wait, where was it? I could have swore. Somebody asked something about the world. For you to know it feels. Also curious how you folks developed the world. So generally when I start making a game, there's usually, there has to be some reason why you decide to start making the game, for me at least. Like there, uh, some sort of pillar, some sort of feeling, something that, that you're trying to capture from the very beginning. And from this, it was, I was, uh, we'd come off the COVID game and I still wanted to make a game about COVID, but in like a more abstract way. Um, I really wanted to, f I, I didn't know what we were making yet, but I knew I wanted it to feel, 
um, like you were locked in a room and you were communicating with people, but only through screens. And that uh, I, I wanted to poke fun at like this absurd situation we were in. And I did the best I could as I animated and as I did the art to like capture that feeling. Um, the first thing I did was animate this character that was kind of like a little bit bouncy, a little bit anxious, doesn't really know what's going on, kind of crawling at the walls whenever you go up to the walls. Like that was the, this animation and the feel of this character was the first thing. And I also thought that would work really well with a Sokoban style game, even though we're, um, even though we are trying to make a game where you can like climb on the, and it, for a Sokoban game, it's pretty freeing. Any Sokoban game by just because of what it is, is going to feel kind of claustrophobic. There's always some kind of restriction in your movement. That's how the puzzles are. Um, and so that was like uh, how I developed the world. I kind of, kind of started with that um, for the first pass of it. Now, obviously, <clears throat> I didn't do all the art. I did the I modeled the everything in the game, but so much of this game is the atmosphere and the lighting. And if you look down at like the backdrop, all that stuff under there, the kind of sci fi stuff. Um, that was all my buddy Mike Snight. We've, we're old friends. Uh, and I went to him and I kind of told him the feeling I wanted to capture, that it was sci-fi, that I, at the time I knew I had like this um, AI voice and, and we were talking about like, uh, obviously Portal was a heavy influence um, and he, <laughs> Portal was a very heavy influence as you can see, because we also knew it was going to be like uh, yellow and blue lasers and it was like, let's just evoke that, screw it. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, a lot of the the... I, Snight, I just gave him ownership of the background. I'm, I'm like, so long as you hit these goals and it captures this feeling, um, do what you want for the backdrop. And he uh, crushed it. I absolutely love what he did. He's he's still working on the project. Um, for some of our other modes, there's different backdrops and they're fantastic. How did you develop the animation? I'm not sure what you mean for that. I don't know if you mean the style or if you mean the, um, like technically how it was done. Uh, Unreal has fantastic animation tools. It's one of the reasons why I prefer it over Unity or any of the other engines. One of the things that impressed me was how quickly you picked up Unreal, by the way. Like I've had, um, I, I've had, I'm trying to think of the only, I've never had somebody who was truly junior. I did have interns at one point at Irrational. Um, and they were like, they had already knew Unreal, but just getting them to learn Perforce was incredibly stressful or the concept of source control. Uh, hmm. was took a while you you like pick this up quickly and I think at one point you made like a, a tool to manage an Excel spreadsheet uh, yes I do love Excel I think Excel is great uh, mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun in both in college and in my in my job and I think it's really handy but uh, in the end I also moved past from that as I I um, I learned more about the shortcuts and everything to work faster in, in Unreal. But I think it was easy to start working in Unreal because I was actually only using the level editor. So it was just getting to know how to duplicate stuff, how to delete stuff, how to move, uh, uh, how to select a lot of uh, objects at the same time. So I think that was uh, that why it was easier that the first time I I was with Unreal Engine that I was start uh, trying to learn blueprints mm. and without a game in mind. Yeah, that was much more scary. I do understand the flow of uh, how how to look at what, one of those diagrams and the ideas, but just the fact that you need to learn the name of every every function and it's. It's a learning a new vocabulary each time oh, yeah. you learn a language. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely jumping in from zero. I'm not really sure how you would do it, um, hmm. especially because you were also learning basic game concepts like what is a player controller and so forth. So I think starting. Um, oh, I don't know. I, I shill hard for Epic, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I can definitely see wanting to start with something more lightweight. Hmm. Oh. I'm curious about Game Maker because they have their own uh, scripting language in that, right? Yeah, they have. They you can both make games with drag and drop me methods, kind of uh, like construct, uh, construct two and three, and and I guess one two, mm -hmm. and and then you ha they have a own language that is based on C plus plus, but it's uh, their own language. Uh, at the end, that is much simply uh, simpler. You can not add a semicolon after every line or something like that. So I find it uh, pretty straightforward. 
once you know how to code in any language. You need to go, you really need to learn the uh, the syntax, generic syntax, how loops work, etc. To, mm. I guess, for blueprints, it's the same because you are making loops and you're making this uh, larger st structure that h are intertwined. Mm. So, I I do think that once you learn uh, one language, it's easier to learn any other one. That's true. I do think there's um. So programmers generally are better at blueprint. I do find that uh, some people just hate visual scripting, like. There's a the ability to just some people are just just take better to text. I personally prefer visual scripting to text. I think it's interesting. There's going to be a um, <clears throat> right now the problem. Well, the problem right now a common complaint about the Unreal Engine is that working in C plus plus is a major drag, um, and so and most programmers hate the engine because they usually work in C plus plus and the content people usually work in Blueprint, but they're adding. Um, Sometime after UE5 comes out, they're adding a new scripting language that's going to sit in between those two, which is really going to change things because they're they're basically writing a scripting language uh, to kind of live between Blueprint and C++ so you don't have to compile the damn engine every time you want to make a C++ change. And that's going to, um, how do I put it? There are these sort of inflection points, like when Blueprint uh, like w when UE4 came out, it was huge because Kismet went away and Blueprint came around and Blueprint is just so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to have another inflection point whenever that drops. And I think that's going to like, there's going to be a scramble where we all have to learn that as quickly as possible and so forth. But that's that's a different conversation. Sorry, that's boring. No, no, no. no. It's, uh, it's important to know, to know how the engine changed. Yeah. Yeah. You think you want to keep working in Unreal? Uh, I don't know. Uh, for example, I don't think Unreal is the great uh, option for game jams. I don't think uh, for th 72 hours it's not great, but it's much more power powerful than Game Maker, and probably it's even it has less re restrictions. So it makes sense to work in the end in Unity or Unreal. Those are like the biggest uh, engines, and it's for a, a reason. But I, for game jams, I will continue to work with Game Maker because it's so fast that I'm just amazed. I, I, I can finish games because I, before I started working on them, it's, it's great. Mm, cool. Okay. That's good to know. Um, yeah, what else should we talk about? Uh, so, yeah, what have you learned while working on LabRat? How is this? Uh, how, I've, this is weird because like I'm interviewing you, but I'm also like, yeah, ha ha am I doing a good job? Are you having fun, Lucas? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm having fun. Uh, well, I think what I learned is basically basically how to work in, in longer games, in this uh, six to ten hours idea uh, where you have to take care of about player retention uh, and all type of players. So it's, it's you're trying to... You need to know what's your specific target audience, but at the same time, you want that target to be as wide as, as possible. So you need to think not only about what do you want the game to be, but what what the people would need the game to be. So I think in that sense, uh, and reflected in the in in the in puzzle design, is having these little treats where you have where changing things uh, doesn't mean. Uh, the lack of challenge doesn't mean that there's lack of fun. You can have fun in a lot of different ways. So uh, it makes sense to to just pace. Uh, well, the, there's actually something that I, I I I thought the other day, and during this beta, there were the there was a lot of of people that kind of complained that the first four levels were a bit more difficult than the four last levels. Even if you have this idea of non-linear map, uh, and you can actually make the uh, play the levels in the order you, you like, but the fact uh, that uh, we have a numbering system there mm -hmm. uh, made people link the difficulty, the challenge, the challenge level of a level to the number that w was there. And once we change the number of the levels, no one said anything about that, even if they are exactly the same levels in the same map. We just seem, uh, change the numbers. So I think there was something interesting there. It's a really minimal thing, but 
uh, that numbers in that sense can break the li linearity, can can make it look more linear than it really is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an uh, interesting thought, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a couple of interesting UI things. How you present the puzzles is huge. Um, and it, it is something that's definitely worth thinking about. And, and it's like, uh, when we have difficult puzzles, we don't even give them numbers, we give them diamonds. And that's important so that people don't feel like they have to collect them. Or do you remember that moment when we m moved over from having everything on one big map to having four sections? Yeah. And how much bigger the game felt as soon as we did that? Like, all of a sudden, it just feels like a real game, right? Um, completely. It was just such a small change. Um, but yeah, the, the perception of that stuff. Yeah, but, but I, I can imagine the same with a book. If a book has no chapters, uh, when when will I stop reading? I think it's, mm, it's less um, stressful to have uh, the content like in different boxes that you will tackle one at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely it helps with the sense of completion it helps it helps break things up thematically and, and that sort of thing um did you create all of your own assets for lab rat for the most part i uh the models he, i modeled my buddy snite did the texturing um and the lighting uh because i would just give them like a flat color and i'd be like snite make this look good um <laughs> the effects i actually bought off of was the store so the the beam effects, I, I found some some lightning effects off of the marketplace for thirty five bucks, uh, and repurposed that and kind of like heavily modified that. I actually contacted the um, we needed a similar effect for later in the game, so I actually contacted the person that that made that and uh, hired him on freelance. I don't think I told you about this for like a week to to modify some of the the effects at the end of the game. Hmm. Um, yeah, Matthew, I he. Um, the basically I contacted the person that made that marketplace asset and he uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, <laughs> anyway, did you have to have financing for this or has it been a side project? If you do have financing, what sort of budget is required to make a game of this scale? Um, this was self funded for a while. I planned to self fund it, but I did take a bit of a hedge. I basically had somebody who I was like, this is our budget. If you pay a quarter of it, you can get a quarter of the profit and uh we we worked it out um so i i did take a hedge uh lucas is working um largely for rev share or profit share um so there's that so it's difficult to talk about the, the finances too much um i will say what is i think i've said before that the budget for this game if we were paying ourselves and everything would be about three hundred thousand. uh so now you know too much. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I wish we. I wish it was just people were more public about how much they spend on things. I think that would actually help. Um, anyway, is it possible to assemble a game out of spaghetti or gorilla glue? Well, we're gonna find out, poor Ponky. Let's see how this goes. <laughs> there are kinds out there somehow. And that was made entirely in Blueprint. Uh, and that shipped on everything, so it's clearly possible. I definitely do not have the programming background. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and what have you learned during Labyrinth? Because, what have I learned? Oh, 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 yeah, you, you have a lot of years of experience, but if you stop learning at some point, uh, there must be something that new that you've encountered this, this time. Oh, loads. Yeah, loads. Like, it's been unbelievable. I mean, I've never done... So the idea to do VO, um, that was definitely... Like, I, how do I put it? There was VO on Bioshock Infinite, but I had nothing to do with that. Um, mm -hmm. And figuring out... Yeah, the audio system, how to do that, how to set up that pipeline, how to make that funny. Writing in general um for for somebody that has vo is is different i've never had to like i'm way outside of my wheelhouse right now because so much of this game is this kind of funny narrator that's talking at all times and i've got no experience in any of that really uh so that's all hmm. just new stuff i'm trying um so for me this is a completely different game right like the last game i worked on was definitely a sokoban game but all that sokoban stuff is you're handling um and i'm mostly uh because Lucas has designed every puzzle in the game, I think, at this point. 
Um, yeah, almost everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just focus on the programming, which is really Zen-like, actually, because it's it's really stressful to hand the creative stuff, the what stuff is the stuff you can't rush and it takes forever. And it's the kind of the the kinds of things that don't have that are subjective, um, like music, figuring out what is the music and getting that together and to tie together. Like there's a reason I'm giving that to Lucas. I'm like, I have too many of the creative decisions. And it's really I, I actually really enjoy the OK, Lucas has found several bugs. Lucas wants a mechanic and all I have to do is program it. And that's just really enjoyable. Um, it's just fun to just sit back and like make something work. Um, uh, it's also fun uh, from the other side, uh, wanting something to work and just waiting a couple of minutes and then magically everything works as you want it and just you, I can use it to create the levels. It's, re it's a comfortable spot, I, I, I should say. Yeah, and the other thing is like we work at the same time, so it's pretty really fast. Uh, Lucas will ask for something in in Discord. I'll we'll try it. It'll work or it won't, and then I'll I'll go like change it. And it because we can do this really quickly. It's it's really good. Hmm. Um, I haven't heard of people at your level doing much rev share. How do you develop contracts for this? I've got a series of contradictory responses from lawyers. Is this complicated by working internationally? Okay, I would never do rev share normally. Um, for one thing, if I was to set up a norm, like a studio, well, this goes into a lot of things. Like, I don't know if I'll ever grow a chump squad. If I did, how many people would I want to have? Probably not that many. Um, if I had a studio, I think I would, after profit share, there would probably be a pool that would be divided up between employees as like a bonus. Um, and so I would think of it as like, after the company has recouped whatever it is spent to make the game, which would include everybody's salaries, there would probably be something like a, I don't know, 40% of the profit at that point gets divided between the employees based on hours they worked on the project or, or some metric like that, right? Like, I, th I think that would be more normal. Um, and the reason I did rev share with Lucas was because I thought we were making a tiny game jam game. And uh, Hello. <laughs> and it grew a lot bigger, and I have no regrets whatsoever. This is Lucas is incredibly easy to work with. He's uh, if he had abandoned the project, I would have been pretty fucked. Like, but he didn't, so it worked out. Um, I think there, it just takes a certain amount of trust, um, and I I pretty hmm. quickly trusted Lucas because he's just not going to abandon the project. Clearly, right? In fact, you um. you quit. Uh, your job and you work full time, full time on yeah. your lab right now. So went yes, quite in the opposite yes. direction. <laughs> yeah, if I if I drop lab right now, I would be completely full. <laughs> it, it wouldn't make any sense uh, that the, to make that decision. Yeah. Um. So, uh, is it complicated by working internationally? Um. <clears throat> We'll find out. <laughs> I don't think so. Right now, we're uh, I everybody I pay. I mean, I pay international people as ten ninety nine contractors. I don't have any salary employees. I'm not even an employee of my own company. So I I treat it as a pass through LLC where I give. This is super boring. Uh, I pay myself dividends out of the company in the form of guaranteed payments, and I don't have any actual employees. Uh, L Chump Squad is a pass through LLC right now. In the event that I have employees, things get a lot more complicated um, because then you have salary benefits, the mm. taxes, bureaucracy gets bigger. I have looked into it because I am interested in hiring Lucas at some point full time. Don't tell him that. Uh, and I, it looks like the, the way to do it would be uh, he would found a company in Spain and uh, I would pay like 1090. It would just be like paying 1099 to Lucas. A Salafranca, and so it would be 1099 to the name of his company, um, and that would that way his taxes and my taxes would be kosher. Um, what sort of time commitment was for this? So for me, I was I decided to work on it full. The agreement when we made the rough share was I would work on it full time, and Lucas would work on it part time, because uh, he had a part time job, and yeah. yeah, I would do the art, the programming, and he would do the design of the puzzles. Uh, Lucas, question for you. How is the game dev scene in Spain? Uh, right now, I don't think there's much. Uh, 
And before that, I was uh, um, actually not the best person to know that. I I barely had time to go to these meetups, but I do uh, found one that I really liked and ended like two months after that. So that was a bummer. But so I didn't really have a, a local um, net here. It, it was difficult for me to... I, I mean, puzzle games are not really exciting for most people, so I was kind of dragged behind in the conversations. They were talking about games that I, did, I didn't know, the games I, I didn't know about, they didn't know. So it was difficult to really form a, a connection. And after COVID, uh, well, I'm just at the same point as three years ago when I knew no one, almost. Yeah. Yeah. That's really gutting local communities or local game dev scenes. Like the, I, I mean, the Boston's trying to keep it together. They have like a, a, one of the like Boston Indies is a local group, and they they have like a, uh, they get together on Twitch and they try to build a community on Discord. But it's it's just not the same when you can't see people face to face. I'm really really grateful for Alan's Discord and for the different Discords and online communities I'm in these days. Like it's how I get by. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's kind of always how I've gotten by because I don't leave the house even. Uh, how do I put this? I think I, I mentioned this when I was talking to Alan and, and Corey the other day. When you're in AAA, you bond with your coworkers. There's a camaraderie because you're all working on the game at the same time. You're all working on a feature. You know, um, when you're indie, especially if you're a solo dev or a smaller indie, you so need that group of people you reach out to. So hmm. when I was at the Molasses Flood, I I had a, a private group of animators from different studios or from AAA, and we all hung out in a Discord, and I could show them animation because nobody else at the Molasses Flood did animation, and I needed feedback, you know? Um, or now, like, uh, every now and then, if I'm lonely or bored, I can pop into Thinky Puzzle Discord and read what other people are doing. And uh, these, these communities are so beneficial. Hmm. Yeah. I agree completely. All right. Well, we have done this for an hour. So I think that was our allotted time. Do you guys Great have any more job. questions? We'll hang out for as long as you have questions. Yeah. What are the nice. So far, nothing on Steam. Well, there's a congratulation on winning the ATT award when. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I have the sweater. They sent me a sweater. That was cool. Um, yeah, congratulations to you too, Lucas. Oh, thank you. Uh, what are the nice discords? I highly recommend the Thinky Puzzle Discord. Sure, half the people here are from it, so somebody can link you a link. Um, that would be Alan Hazelden's Discord. Uh, you can also join the Chump Squad Discord. We are super chill, but that's mostly just talking about Chump Squad stuff or game industry business stuff. So if you've more questions about taxes and hiring people internationally because <laughs> some people here are fascinated by that you can always drop in the chump squad discord and i will talk your ear off on the boring shit because i live that uh but do you ever run switch streams while you're working and animating i used to um so i streamed quite a bit of development for kine i stopped for this one for several reasons one being that my internet is crap uh and I'm very fortunate that it's working this week, but um, it's just been awful. Uh, it, it just goes down sometimes. Uh, if somehow it, it does seem to go down mostly in the afternoon, which is good because that's not when Lucas needs it. Because the per force is literally like uh, our our source control is in a here. Um, so when my internet's down, nobody in the team can work, which sucks. Um, I could go into this, but it's a real problem. The other reason is. Um, I can't really stream doing writing, like create, coming up with ideas. Uh, I, I just kind of got to focus for that or think about it or daydream a little. Um, I can't really stream like doing VO uh, I, because again, that, that it kind of falls in the same thing. A lot of the stuff I'm doing for this game because it's a very different game, it's difficult to stream. And I also don't want to spoil the end of the game. And a lot of the stuff I'm doing is for the end. The, the later stuff in the game and I kind of want some of it to be a surprise. So for like a multitude of reasons, I haven't streamed much about the game dev for this one. Is Perforce dominant in game dev versus something like Git? 
Okay, so Git, if I recall, is a really popular one in software. <clears throat> in AAA, everybody uses Perforce. Um, therefore, I use Perforce, uh, but it is insanely expensive. So if you have five users or less, uh, Perforce is free. And I've been fortunate enough to keep us at five workspaces exactly, but it does mean like we, it, the system is starting to buckle under this reality. Like uh, when I brought Matthew, the effects guy I mentioned before on, I had to take away Perforce access from our audio guy for the two weeks he was here. Um, and if I want to, I can't bring anybody else into the project without knocking somebody else off the project at this point. And if I want to bring anybody else like the, to, what is it? As soon as you go over five workspaces, you have to pay for all of them. So you have to pay for six. And I think it's something like six or 700 bucks a workspace. I don't remember um, I, every year. Um, so it's, it's very expensive source control, which is why it's maybe not the best for indies. Hmm. Yeah. Now we're talking source control. Fascinating people, just fascinating <laughs> bullshit going on here. A, a lot of, uh, a subversion has been recommended to me and I'll probably look into that just because I would like to have a system that's a little more flexible and I don't know. You know, I drew, every game I do, I want to be a little bit bigger, a little bit more ambitious, maybe. Uh, and we're creaking right now, right? Like right now I, I have to play musical chairs with my source controls. So I don't think this is very sustainable. Um, it's definitely the dominant software dev, but I don't know how it would handle huge assets. Yeah, I think that was what I heard is that it's terrible for binary files. But I'm just repeating shit I know. I've never used Git. I used Tortoise SVN when I was in college. And um, nobody there, I was I was working with like people from the internet that have no idea what source control is. And, and it was just immediately terrible, like a terrible experience. Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, what non-boring questions should we have asked? I don't know. I just... <laughs> I don't mean to insult your questions. I apologize. I just feel like, yeah, uh, mm. good point. Sorry. I suppose this is this is what is the people want to hear. Um, it stores separate copies of file revisions and not diffs. What is the Chump Squad Discord? I can handle that one. Give me a second. Here you go. That is the Chump Squad Discord. <clears throat> Dumb questions are like the rule. <laughs> oh, let me think. What else should we talk about, Lucas? I feel like this is this is the first. How did this go? This is your first time streaming, talking to the world. Yes, it did was, and it was a great experience, actually. That's good. It was kind of nervous, but the usual amount of nervous in my day-to-day -day life. Okay, so you're generally full of anxiety. Yeah, it's not anxiety, it's just uh, <laughs> excitement. Yeah, well, this is cool. Do you think you'll, uh, is this the beginning of a streaming uh, pro streamer? Lucas, you wanna? I don't think so, I don't think so. I will be uh, the, suddenly every day in Twitch, but I, I started seeing this as something more manageable than I initially thought. All right, cool. Yeah. Why is the blue color dominating the game? Having come from a theater. Uh, oh, um, is it normal to use your real name or username? I don't know. It depends on the Discord. Uh, yeah, I would just... Every Discord is different. It's like a chat room. There's no rule. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, on my Discord, you can do whatever you feel. I use my own name so that people know who I am. But that's yeah. that. All right. I if... don't do use my my real name, and I don't think there's a problem. Yeah, you. I, Liz Slow is cool. I, I but you use that as like your signature on everything, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right, I think we're done here, guys. I think we're, we're probably going to take off and get on with our days. I really do appreciate everybody hanging out. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, this is really fun. 
And thanks for joining us, Lucas. Oh, no problem. Thanks for joining you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.